What do you get when you take a hatchback, a hot rod, a truck, a station wagon, an old person's car, a young person's car, retro styling, factory flame decals, and Brian Setzer? A big old mess is what you get. None of you asked for this episode, but we did it anyway. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on the PT Cruiser. You gotta jump and jive it, then you better gotta jump and jive it. A big old thanks to Omaze for partnering with us on this episode. Right now, Omaze is giving away a brand new BMW M8 competition coupe. That means free, all right? You don't pay taxes. You don't pay transport, nothing. You get 617 Hertz all wheel drive, and an eight speed transmission with merino leather seats and a limited edition paint scheme plus 20,000 freaking dollars cash. Every donation gives you a chance to win and benefits the Ronald Reagan Medical Center at UCLA, the same people that saved my life. Every donation will help them buy ECMO heart machines, which are crucial in saving lives of heart attack victims. To show your support for me being alive and uh, your support of other people in the future remaining alive and your chance to win an awesome car and a bunch of cash. Go to omaze.com slash donut for your chance to win. If you win, I will go to lunch with you. You have to pay though, because you're a 20,000 air. Thanks, Omaze. In the late 70s, Chrysler was hurting. The third largest automaker in Detroit was waging a losing war on two fronts. On one side was the oil crisis, which caused fuel prices in the US to skyrocket. On the other side, Japan saw America's need for more fuel efficient cars and they freaking delivered. And America freaking gobbled them, gobbled them up. Is that a Civic? Was that a Corolla? Was that a Sentra? I don't have any room left in my belly for American cars. By the time American car companies realized they had to switch things up, the Japanese brands were already ahead. Chrysler desperately needed a new model that could compete. This today is not a laser and light show. This is strictly a product and engineering show. And maybe you'll be bored by it, I don't know. Lee Iacocca. Lee Iacocca. Put the plan into action, developing the platform for the K car. And a designer at Chrysler by the name of Tom Gale helped bring the K car platform to life. K cars like the Dodge Aries and Plymouth Reliant were boxy and boring, no frills, but they were exactly what parent company Chrysler needed. Despite their subdued appearance, these cars sold fantastically well. From 1981 to 1988, Chrysler sold 300,000 of these things every freaking year. But now Chrysler had another issue to deal with. People now viewed their brands as boring and painted various shades of beige. Beige is my favorite color. Oh yeah, why is that? Uh, it looks great on cargo shorts, on cargo vests, cargo hats, cargo jeans, cargo jackets. Hmm. Anyway, by the late 1980s, Plymouth's sister company Dodge was rebranding and trying to turn their image around. <laughs> The Viper prototype debutted at the 1989 Detroit Auto Show and whoo baby, people freaking loved it. Seemingly overnight, it transformed Dodge from the sleepy grandpa brand it was in the 80s into a performance leader. Plymouth watched as their cool big brother got buff in the front yard and they were like, I wanna be big buff guy too. Tom Gale being a hot rod dude at heart threw around a couple of concepts, but it was a project by a student at the Art Center College of Design by the name of Douglas Foose, AKA Chip. You know, the world doesn't need another hot rod, but the greatest thing about this industry is it's 100% passion driven. His design, the hemisphere was sleek, aggressive, and it harkened back to the 1930s era of hot rods. Tom Gale was immediately intrigued by Chip's project. The final product, the Prowler concept, was fun and radical and unlike any other car on the road. It had a sharp angled grille, aggressive look, and indie style wheels. The two seater would be constructed with aluminum and composite materials, a technique far outside of the K car maker's wheelhouse.
Get it? The debut of The Prowler was won up by numerous over-the-top reveals at that show. 1993 was a good year to be at the Detroit Auto Show. Porsche unveiled their new car, the Boxer, and Plymouth's cool, older, buff brother Dodge unveiled the Ram pickup. Once again, Dodge had hit a home run. So Plymouth got jealous all over again and started designing a more practical version of The Prowler. But with the same heritage styling. So in 1997, the Plymouth Pronto concept debuted. It was an affordable, fun, five-door concept that had visible styling cues from the Prowler, specifically the pointed grille and split bumper. And it came in a color called Cool Vanilla, which is coincidentally the stage name I use when I play sax in my band, Sax Evasion. <laughs> A year later, the Pronto Spider concept was released. This two-door roadster had a 2.4 liter turbocharged four-cylinder mid-mounted engine that made 225 horsepower. And it was small and only weighed 2,700 pounds. Well, soon after, Chrysler debuted the all-wheel drive Pronto Cruiser with a Z. Are you kidding me? That's so cool. <laughs> Meanwhile, the production Plymouth Prowler debuted in 1998 and was immediately met with criticism. Sure, people loved the radical styling, but Plymouth did a little oopsie in the pants and only offered it with a very boring V6. Could have had a V8. Despite the lukewarm reception, Chrysler didn't consider it to be a failure. It was never meant to be a volume car. The Prowler was an experiment in the production of aluminum cars. That's what us in the biz call big picture stuff. Chrysler debuted the PT Cruiser concept at the 1999 Detroit International Auto Show. PT stood for personal transit. By the turn of the new millennium, you know when we all died? Chrysler had created a lot of positive buzz around the car and people couldn't wait to find out what this heritage hot rod wagon thing was all about. It was a tall and stout utilitarian hot rod with a bunch of space. It looked vaguely familiar, but also no one had seen anything like it ever before. Engineers and designers used VR and DMA, a CAD type system, to structure the PT. These programs were extremely helpful in development as engineers could use virtual reality to assemble components and assure the proper fit before a physical prototype was ever built. After years of hard work and testing, the dream of Chrysler and Tom Gale was about to materialize. Finally, you've been talking about friggin' VR for like an hour now. I missed you, buddy. What the? The PT Cruiser had a wheelbase of 103 inches, stood tall at 63 inches high, and weighed just over 3,000 pounds. It was basically a little box, and all the seats except for the driver's seat folded down thanks to the use of a twist beam axle and Watts linkage. The standard engine that we got was a 2.4 liter inline four that made 150 horsepower, and that was shared by the Chrysler Cirrus, Dodge Stratus, I drive a Dodge Stratus, and the Plymouth Breeze. The interior also had a very unique style. In it, a four-spoke steering wheel, deep set gauges, color matched dash panels, and a cue ball style shifter. Although it didn't look much like a truck, the PT Cruiser is designated as a light truck in order to pass stringent emission laws. They plan to build 180,000 the first year, but then they ran into a problem. The engine bay only had 0.6 of an inch clearance for the engine because it had been engineered to use every last bit of space. They had to slow production down and retrain everyone, but eventually they got the hang of stuffing the engines in and production got back up to speed. Hey guys, what's up? James here from the video that you're watching now. I just want to interrupt myself to let you know about a really exciting new project that we got going on here at Donut. It's called Money Pit. We have a new project car, a beautiful NA Miata, and every week we're going to show you how to work on a different aspect of the car. You want to learn what parts of your car do? You want to learn how to fix them and replace them? This is the show for you. And Zach Job, my team high from High Low companion, is just the guy to do it. And luckily, he's hosting the show. So it's every Wednesday. It's really cool. Uh, make sure you watch it so that we're allowed to buy more cars and work on them. I encourage you to build along. Let's do it.
PT Cruiser, you're probably not even watching it anymore. <laughs> in its first year of production, Chrysler sold 175,000 PT Cruisers across 58 different countries. It even won Motor Trend's Car of the Year in 2001. Dealers couldn't keep them in stock and soon the wait lists filled up. Enthusiasm for the Cruiser matched and even surpassed that of the new Beetle. It was relatively cheap, fun, and had a cool factor, which is how moms describe things. But the most exciting, has to be. You gotta jump and jiving, then you better gotta jump and jiving. The Brian Setzer Vavoom Setzer Cruiser. It featured a built-in guitar rack, an amp in the cab, and the word Vavoom on the fender to promote Setzer's album. I would love to get my hands on one of those sweet, sweet bad boys. In 2001, they debuted the PT Woody and Dream Cruisers. The Woody was a limited run of a thousand cars in a 1960s surf wagon style. And apparently it was a collaboration with the East Coast based Ron John Surf Shops. Cool. <laughs> the Dream Cruiser was named after an annual event in Detroit. Every year, up to one and a half million people and 30,000 cars cruise Woodward Street, one of the best cruise strips in the US. They came in Inca gold with gold colored matrix leather seats. In Europe, they were called street cruisers. They only made 7,500 of these and had numbered plaques in the middle console. <laughs> The PT Cruiser was meant to appeal to a younger audience. It was cheap, customizable, and most importantly, unique. But when Chrysler took a look at who was actually buying it, they were quite surprised. We're talking about the cat in the PT Cruiser. Turns out when you build a car that's meant to look like it was a car from the 30s, the only people that buy that car are the ones who lived through the 30s. Now, it doesn't matter if the customers were old or not, PT Cruisers were still selling. 2002 was the first year you could get your PT Cruiser with flame decals from the factory. Chrysler was like, young people like flames, right? Young people like power, right? So they added a little bit more of it. <laughs> the PT Cruiser GT Turbo High Output had an updated version of the turbocharged 2.4 liter four cylinder and now made 220 hertz per. It could do zero to 60 in 7.5 seconds, which is not great. And for 28 grand, which is about $41,000 today, it wasn't worth it. Again, Chrysler was sending mixed signals. On one hand, they wanted to give the kids the Mo Power Baby, but on the other hand, what kid can afford a $41,000 retro car? 2004 marked the first year PT convertibles went on sale and fans have been holding their breath since the concept debuted four years earlier. It took so long because instead of retrofitting an already existing PT, the convertible had to be completely redesigned. Nothing from the A pillar back on the convertible was interchangeable with regular PT cruisers. It was also very quiet. Another thing that old people love. It was said that you could have a picnic table conversation with your passenger while the top was down. Oh, just talk about as loud as you would talk at a picnic table. What the does that mean? The regular PT was updated as well with the new front. From the outside, it would seem like a small change, but to PT loyalists, this was a freaking slap in the face, all right? So much so that they call any cruiser from 2004 on the second gen, even though technically there's only one generation over the lifespan of the PT. <laughs> PT car people are the most intimidating type of car people because why the f do they like it? The general public also began to turn on the Heritage Cruiser. Maybe it was the lame corporate custom mods. Maybe it was that Michael Scott drove one on the office. It's Britney, bitch. Despite all the shortcomings, Chrysler sold a buttload of them. By the time production ended in 2010, over 1 million PT Cruisers were sold. If there's one thing that can be said about the PT Cruiser, it's that it didn't look like anything else on the road. It may have been a little bit out of touch, but their experiment with aluminum construction was a success. 
Thank you so much for watching. We got a lot of new stuff in the works. We're gonna have shows every single day. Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell to make sure that you don't miss any of it. Follow Donut on Twitter and Instagram at Donut Media. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at James Pumphrey. If you want some Donut merch, go to DonutMedia.com. Our newest item, I'm really excited about these. It's enamel pins that we made with Lean Customs. Now, if you know anything about car pins, you'll know that Lean Customs is a really, really great name in the biz. We're super excited about these. DonutMedia.com. I love you.